Hello and welcome to Phil Fisher's Get Data Protection Fit series for 2023. My name is Nuria Pastor and I'm a director in Phil Fisher's Data and Privacy team. Today I'm joined by colleagues Camille Ebden, who is a senior associate in the team, and Chloe Abbott, an associate in the team. As our regular listeners will be aware, this is our third series of Gate Data Protection Feed, and this episode is number four of our five-part spotlight on international data transfers. Today, we will be focusing on binding corporate rules. The learning outcomes from today's session are that you should be able to understand what binding corporate rules are, when they might be an appropriate data transfer mechanism for your organization, what the elements of binding corporate rules are, how the approval process works, and what happens after approval. I will now hand over to Chloe. Thank you, Nuria. Before I explain what binding corporate rules are, I think it is important to clarify where they sit within the wider sphere of data transfers. Now, for the purposes of this session, we're going to use the term EU and EEA for European Economic Area interchangeably. You may already be aware that the UK and the EU data protection legislation imposes restrictions on personal data transfers outside of these territories. Transfers of personal data to countries which have been deemed adequate are not restricted. These are countries that have been granted adequacy status by the European Commission or the UK Secretary of State, respectively. It means the standard of data protection is essentially equivalent to that of the EU or UK. Transfers of personal data to non-adequate countries require data transfer mechanisms, unless a derogation applies. Not many countries are considered adequate, and there are only a handful of derogations, which are to be interpreted narrowly. Therefore, the majority of transfers will require a data transfer mechanism. One of these are the EU standard contractual clauses, or the UK's equivalent. These are the most common way to transfer personal data to a non-adequate country. Another method are binding corporate rules, BCRs for short, which will be the focus of our session. These are sets of rules which allow multinational companies to transfer personal data freely within their group entities anywhere in the world. For reasons we will explain today, before being able to rely on binding corporate rules, there are various legal and practical steps to achieve. What are BCRs? BCRs are a group-wide global privacy framework reviewed and approved by UK or European supervisory authorities. BCRs allow the transfer of personal data outside of the EU or UK, and they can apply to all transfers within group companies around the world. That said, although BCRs may cover all transfers, they might not actually do this. In other words, the group may decide to have BCRs only for their transfers of HR data or to have proce processor BCRs only. Um, BCRs are tailor-made to the particular needs of a given company and they enshrine core data protection principles and practices to apply GDPR standards of data protection for personal data. They can be signed by all group members, which would then be bound to comply with the BCR rules created by a binding intergroup agreement. There are two different types of BCRs, controller and processor. Controller BCRs are for data transfers from EU established controllers to other controllers or to processors within the group who are established outside of the EU. Processor BCRs apply where group members transfer personal data as processors and subprocessors for an external non-group controller. I will now discuss some benefits and challenges of BCRs. First of all, we will have to consider the benefits. So once approved, BCRs are considered the gold standard solution for European 
customers, regulators and consumers. They are typically seen as best in class for privacy compliance. This might give BCR holders a competitive advantage over others in the market, which is especially relevant in the context of processor BCRs. There is also an issue of perception. One of the key tenets of GDPR compliance is to show accountability under the GDPR. BCRs are publicly available and can show accountability to regulators, customers and employees alike. In terms of global applicability, many non-European countries, including Switzerland, Singapore, Japan and South Africa, acknowledge BCRs within the data protection legislation or regulatory guidance as valid data transfer mechanisms. Furthermore, BCRs are more than a data transfer mechanism. They produce valuable structure and documents which result in a standardization and simplification across the group. One of the benefits of the BCRs, indeed, is that it provides global groups of entities with a policy framework based on GDPR standards which can be applied globally. However, there are some challenges with um, putting BCRs in place. Um, there are indeed other data transfer mechanisms that are available to controllers and processors which are equally valid under the law and are quicker to put in place. Putting BCRs in place will require engaging in an application process which can be resource in intensive and due to various circumstances may take a long time. By virtue of the BCR process, the visibility of the regulators and the published nature of BCRs, BCR applicants and, and the future BCR holders can be subject to scrutiny from regulators and even potentially competitors. There are also administrative requirements, for example, annual updates for regulatory compliance, which will require the commitment of internal resource. Putting in place BCRs does not remove the requirement to complete a, data, a, a transfer impact assessment. I will now look at the post-Brexit landscape. Since Brexit, it is necessary to distinguish the UK approach from that of the EU's. This is because after Brexit, the UK is no longer a member of the European Union. The UK GDPR recognises BCRs as a data transfer mechanism under UK law. In this slide, we provide a summary of the relevant documents that you will need to consider when putting together a BCR application under the EU or UK data protection law. We have also provided links to the documents and to the list of current BCR holders. As you will see when you access the documents, the referential tables include information about the different requirements that BCRs must meet and additional guidance regarding how to address such requirements within the BCR documents. The referential tables also clarify the BCR documents in which such requirements should be addressed. For instance, whether certain information should be addressed in the application form and or in the BCR policy documents. With regards to the UK, some listeners may be aware that the UK is currently in the process of reforming its data protection regime. Whilst this is still going through Parliament, at the time of recording, the current new bill, the Data Protection and Digital Information No. 2 bill, which makes tweaks to the GDPR language, but on the whole, maintains the UK process for BCRs. Thank you, Nuria. So what are the elements of a set of BCRs? The suite of documents that make up the BCRs includes the BCR policy, 
which both the controller set or the processor set will have. And this should set out the scope of the BCRs, such as what types of personal data are in scope, the obligations of the BCR group members under the BCRs, as well as details of third party beneficiary rights. The policy then normally contains certain appendices, namely a list of the BCR group members, a fair information disclosures appendix with details of the transparency information that will be provided to data subjects, an audit protocol, a complaint handling procedure, a data protection rights procedure, a cooperation procedure, setting out how the BCR group members will cooperate with supervisory authorities regarding the BCRs, a privacy compliance structure. This sets out how the group members compliance with the BCRs and data protection laws will be managed by the BCR group, a law enforcement structure, a government request response procedure, setting out how group members must respond if a non-EU government requests personal data that's protected under the BCRs. An updating procedure. This describes how changes to the BCRs will be communicated to supervisory authorities, data subjects and the BCR group members. And a description of the training program to train BCR members, staff, how to comply with the BCRs. Last but not least, there needs to be a binding corporate mechanism, which ensures that the BCRs are binding on each member. Often this might be some form of intergroup agreement known as an IGA. So over now to Chloe. If a company is seeking to get EU BCRs approved, it needs to propose a supervisory authority to be its lead by submitting part one of the application to that authority. It is up to the applying group to submit their proposal as to which country is appropriate to act as the BCR lead. WP263 provides guidance on relevant factors towards choosing the BCR lead. These criteria include the location of the group's European headquarters, and particular attention will be given to this. The location of the company within the group with delegated data protection responsibilities. The location of the company which is best placed in terms of management function, administrative burden, etc. to deal with the application and to enforce the binding corporate rules in the group. The place where most decisions in terms of the purposes and the means of the processing are taken. And finally, the member state within the EU from which most or all of the transfers outside of the EU will take place. However, these are not formal criteria. The supervisory authority to which the application is sent as the prospective BCR lead will exercise its discretion in deciding whether it is in fact the most appropriate lead supervisory authority. And in any event, the supervisory authorities among themselves may decide to allocate the application to a supervisory authority other than the one to which the group applied, in particular if it would be possible and worth for speeding up the procedure, taking into account, for example, the workload of the originally requested supervisory authority. This question is only relevant to EU BCRs. As for UK BCRs, there is no need to choose a lead. It's the ICO. Thanks, Chloe. So how does the approval process work? Well, the proposed BCR lead will forward to all SAs concerned, supervisory authorities that is, the information that it's received regarding why it's been selected by the applicant to be the lead authority, along with whether or not it agrees to be the BCR lead. There is then a process for the other concerned supervisory authorities to give their views and decide who the lead should be. Once the lead essay has been agreed, the BCR lead essay will carry out its first review of the draft BCR documents and issue comments on those drafts. The BCR applicant then needs to produce revised versions of the BCR documents. 
the lead supervisory authority then sends this first revised draft version to one or two supervisory authorities who will act as co-reviewers and help the BCR lead in the assessment. The number of co-reviewer supervisory authorities depends on the number of member states from which the transfers will take place. There may be several different drafts or exchanges between the applicant and the relevant essays before a consolidated draft is produced that the lead essay and the co-reviewers consider satisfactory. This consolidated draft is then sent to all concerned essays under what's known as the cooperation procedure. The concerned essays have a month to issue any comments and if they do not present a reasoned objection during this period, they are deemed to be in agreement with the consolidated draft. Once the lead essay is of the view that the applicant is in a position to address satisfactorily all the comments received, it will invite the applicant to send a final draft to it. The lead essay then submits it, the, the draft decision, its draft decision on the final draft of the BCRs to the EDPB, that's the Europe, European Data Protection Board, along with all relevant information, documents, and the views of all the concerned supervisory authorities. The EDPB will adopt an opinion on the BCRs. If it endorses approval of the BCRs, the lead essay will adopt its decision approving the draft BCRs. If the EDPB requires any amendments to the draft BCRs, the lead essay has two weeks to tell the EDPB whether it nonetheless plans to approve the draft BCRs, which would kickstart a dispute resolution process, or whether it will request the applicant amends the draft BCRs in accordance with the EDPB's opinion. Once the lead essay has approved the BCRs, all the concerned supervisory authorities are sent a copy. Now, the process I've just described is for the EU BCRs. For UK BCRs, the, pro the procedure is much simpler. It's only the UK that reviews the application. So, what happens after approval? After approval, BCR holders should review on a regular basis to ensure that they continue to accurately align with the, the data flows taking place. An identified person or team or department must keep a fully updated list of the BCR members and a log of any updates to the BCRs. UK and EU BCR holders have to provide an annual update to their lead authority, to the data subjects, which is done by way of online publication, and to the BCR members. This is an annual notification to confirm whether there have been any changes to the BCRs or to the list of BCR members and justifying those changes. However, where there is a material change, that is a change which affects the level of protection offered by the BCRs or significantly affects the BCRs, i.e. changes to the binding character, it must be promptly communicated to the supervisory authority and to all BCR members ahead of the annual update in line with the updates procedure of the particular BCRs. The lead supervisory authority needs to approve the update, which may involve questions and clarification rounds with the BCR holder. No transfer can be made to a new BCR member until the new BCR member is effectively bound by the BCRs and can de deliver compliance. So I'll now turn over to Nuria. Thank you, Camille and Chloe. Relooking at the learning objectives, we hope that from listening to this session, you will now be able to better explain what binding corporate rules are, when they might be an appropriate data transfer mechanism for your organization, what are the elements of binding corporate rules, how the approval process works, 
and what happen happens after approval. Before I conclude today's session, I just wanted to draw your attention to the content of our YouTube channel, which is described in this slide. Finally, here are our contact details if you would like to get in touch with us to discuss PCRs or any other privacy questions. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you have found this session helpful. Goodbye.